Welcome to Hackbits, where we cover a variety of cybersecurity subjects. Join your host, Gaspar Martirano, as he interviews cybersecurity experts and discusses the latest cybersecurity news, trends, data breaches, and updates on state-sponsored cybercrime. Okay, welcome everyone to uh, this edition of Hackbits. Uh, really happy today to have someone that's uh, not only super smart and knows what they're talking about, but just a really good person. So, uh, Justine, it's really a pleasure to have you here on the show. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you so much. Um, an attorney at the law firm DLA Piper, San Diego native, and I specialize in cyber law, which is a combination of proactive and reactive cybersecurity services. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, who I am and what I'm passionate about. Um, but thank you again for hosting. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm really excited. So, so tell me a little bit. I always like to find out kind of the background. Tell me a little bit about your story. When did your interest in technology and even cyber kind of start? Where where was the fire started before it grew into what it is today? The great origin story. Where do we get our roots? Right. <laughs> So, I, you know, going back early old school days uh, when PCs were not a thing in somebody's house, um, I was about five and my parents invested in an Apple IIe computer. And I had three older brothers who were total computer geeks. I mean, you know, Dungeons and Dragons uh, types. <laughs> and, uh, and I watched them uh, use this computer and take it apart and be in their kid sister. I was just really interested in uh, the process. And it was you know, I like new things. I like emerging uh, technologies, and it probably started back in you know the the early '80s. If I'm revealing too much about my age, <laughs> so and then and then later on, when when uh, when you were in law school, what what was kind of your exposure to to systems then? Because I know you know people ask me that question sometimes, and I I always like to bring up, oh, we didn't you know back in my day, we didn't have you know color screens, and you know we had the giant monitors and not these flat beautiful flat screens we see today. So how was it then from uh, college to law school? What was kind of your exposure at that point? Uh, my, I took a non-traditional route uh, to college and law school, um, getting, uh, basically I was a legal secretary to put myself through law school. Okay. And uh, one of my goals was become very proficient in all applications in order to do my job fast. So I could then use time to study for law school while I was still um, in the office. So uh, really it was necessity being the mother of all invention as always. And um, my practice when I first started as a summer associate at a law firm, the federal rules of civil procedure had just been um, proposed. And so that was a early days of e-discovery. And because I had some proficiency in Word and Excel and at the keyboard, and you know, I think this is generally true is they, people think of younger attorneys as being somewhat of digital natives. And during that time in the legal industry, there was definitely a, a disconnect between people who understood how computers worked and those that did not. And so I was lumped in this sort of early generation of people that understood computers, which created a lot of opportunity. So when, when you started uh, working in cyber and law, so tell me a little bit about that and then how that transitioned to what you do now and what the practice kind of focuses on today. It's changed. When I first started practicing cyber law, people thought I was um, insane. <laughs> so there was, a, I, we used to have these great parties and there was um, these, these big martini luges and it was cyber uh, in San Diego. And, and so um, I used to put on my name tag that I was a cyber attorney um, mm -hmm. <laughs> ripping off of uh, the martini, but um, they, you know, people didn't know what it was and it probably wasn't anything, but my practice was really focused on uh, cyber as it practically related to the business enterprise and that intersection with crime. Um, so it was for me, I was tracking a lot of what the FBI was doing around um, cyber forensics using that same language and terminology in the law. And at that time, you know, it was a lot of folks were talking about, you know, privacy and very focused uh, in the law on the privacy regulations. And mine, mine was a little bit different. It was more of the hardware and the operating systems that companies were using and what were the risks associated with using them um, versus the benefits. And that, that I think, is really carried through uh, the last decade or so in my, 
in my practice. And did you notice, because I know early on when it came to technology, especially in businesses, they didn't, did not want to make big investments, right? In security. Uh, I think that they always, it was, it's not going to happen to us or especially small businesses. They wondered, well, why, who would want to hack into our systems? So they didn't put a lot of emphasis on really, you know, they had an antivirus program and thought that was enough. Um, so you've kind of seen the transition from, hey, it, it can't happen to me to, oh no, what if it happens to me? And then and then God forbid when it does happen, what do you do from there? So it's great that you've seen that kind of that life cycle happen. It must've been interesting to watch. Yeah, it's really interesting uh, budget, obviously, uh, being in the business and being a service provider in the business, because really that's what legal is, is we serve clients and customers. And it is always been interesting to me once an event happens, um, that budget opens up a lot more and you okay. sensitize the board and the executive leadership team as to the importance of being uh, more proactive and sort of the, the actual costs and financial risk associated with the breach. But um, the when you don't have a breach and you're trying to appeal to hearts and minds that this is an investment you should make and here's why, that amount was very small. And Laws didn't do a great job of creating these incentives to actually put programs in place to reduce cyber risk. Um, you know, you had this these laws that said you have to keep data secure and you have to use reasonably secure uh, practices, but there was nothing that said you have to have a CISO or you have to have endpoint threat detection or you have to have firewalls or you have to segment your systems. There was nothing specific. And, and in fact, there still isn't, right? I mean, we have regulations, we have frameworks, but there's nothing that specifically calls out and says you have to do this. And so companies were really left to their own risk understanding and awareness to make these decisions. And as we've seen in headlines, they don't always make the right decision until it's right. too late. Well, yeah, that brings me to my next question. So you were involved in one of the largest breaches about 10 years ago. So do you see any stark differences of kind of what, you know, what a breach looked like then? And this is, you know, 10 years seems like a lifetime in technology into what kind of happens today. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit about that experience and how do you think it's evolved to some of the things that you currently see happening in the, in, in the, in, with organizations? Isn't it amazing how quickly technology changes? I mean, during that breach, I don't even think iPhones existed to communicate. So I think I probably had even a BlackBerry at that time in my life, in my well, career. I had the Motorola uh, flip phones. Those razors were very popular back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I definitely had the flip phone. Um, I probably even had a pager. I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> how old school this gets. Right. Um, but when we think about like the technology, yes, I mean, the, the threat vectors have gotten more numerous because we have a lot more connected devices. So right. I'll first say that the type of threat activity that we respond to now is a lot different. Um, then it was really more of we have a either crown jewel crown jewels of our organization. This is where we put our secret sauce, our most proprietary information source yeah. code. And that's always been somewhat protected, right? The the Pepsis and the McDonald's of the world do a really good job of securing that that secret uh, information. Then it was really the data privacy component where we have consumer data and this is financial information or social security numbers. And so um, 10 years ago, that was the focus as we were looking specifically at the databases and maybe putting some security around that. Right. But maybe there wasn't that same sort of appetite for, for implementing security enterprise wide. Right. What we see now is the sophistication of the threat actor is obviously um, much higher. There's a lot of use of, um, I'll call it artificial intelligence, but I think you know that's a, that's a loosey-goosey word right. to use. I think this is um, automated type of threat activity that's happening, happening making it easier um, for the low hanging fruit to be picked. Um, so what we've seen is um, that the types of security that are baked into programs um, and starting, you know, big picture enterprise wide and the technology, but now we're seeing a lot more of the awareness that that simply isn't enough. You can't just you know, secure and have firewall logs or segment a system, you actually have to train people. You have to think about product security. If you're putting uh, devices and software into the wild, we need to think about the security by design there. Um, so we're just seeing more awareness and efforts on people process and technologies. Yeah. And I guess uh, to your point, the way things are interconnected right now, it's, it, you know, it's not just that. 
It's your phone. It could be your house. It could be your car. Uh, it, there's a lot more that can actually happen because everything is so connected. Um, really curious, and I get this question quite often. I love your thoughts on it. People will ask, well, what's the bigger threat? Is it a nation state actor or is it kind of the, you know, the old uh, the, what, what, the guy sitting in the basement, in his mom's basement? You know, who's who's out there and who's really trying to cause the harm? I mean, is, is would you say that it leans towards these nation state or is it kind of those lone wolf people? Uh, back in my day, I know there was a lot of lone, you know, our, we were happy if we broke into a school system and got, you know, were able to look at our grades. Um, it, you know, that was enough. But nowadays, um, you know, are those those lone wolf hackers still a worry or is it really the nation state uh, that should be more of a concern to a lot of businesses out there? I'm going to say yes, yes, all of it. Yeah. And you know, we do a lot of incident response and um, you know, the, the ransomware we've seen in the last couple of years, this isn't a lone warrior, right? This is, this, this is ransom as a service. This is, right layers and layers of criminal activity that got to the point of somebody extorting a company for, you know, money. So I don't think it's lone warrior and I don't think it's nation state actors um, per se. Now, whether they're funded by nation state actors, mm. that could be. Um, yeah. But nobody's ever giving us a clear roadmap that, you know, hey, you know, China or Russia are really, you know, funding this. I think what I see a lot of and what we're responding a lot to and again, I think it's the type of supply chain vulnerability we're seeing right. um, with respect to, you know, trusted software that uh, or devices that are now got some, whether it's, you know, intentional, you know, as far as, you know, solar winds, there was an intentional malicious activity embedded in, in that or on log4j, which is not, it wasn't intentional. It was, this was an accident or somebody didn't fully vet this. Right. And so you've got, right. you know, this supply chain that is somewhat vulnerable. And then you've got companies using those products. And so I think from my perspective, what you have is threat actors who are taking advantage of that. And they have invested and received millions and billions of dollars to fund their criminal enterprise. And so with, you know, I, I'm just seeing those those groups, those crime rings as really being the greatest nuisance. So what are some of the larger challenges you think that organizations and, you know, your clients in particular, what are they facing out there? Is it lack of, I know it's hard to find good people, right? So even just lack of uh, security personnel, the hired people in cyber to come and help protect their companies is a big issue. So I know, you know, companies like us, like uh, Life Ours, we get, you know, we get uh, calls every day and, and sometimes the, the, the security guy is just the, is the IT guy, that, you know, that, that's just handling the network. So is that a challenge? So what are some of the challenges you see out there? Certainly, skills gap in yeah. the uh, investment in on-site people that that actually work for the company. But I do think that the industry is becoming more robust in the ability to outsource security. Right. right. So most company, I would say, oh, every company is going to have some component of an outsourced information security maturity level. Right. So whether that's fully or partially, but um, I do think that you can shift some of those responsibilities outside. They don't have to be on staff. Um, but it's some a champion internal to the organization is really important. So I think having somebody that really understands the risk and can explain it. Um, one of the challenges I see a lot of is um, that organizations are accepting risk they don't actually understand. Right. Um, and what I mean by that is if somebody said it's going to be $100,000 to fix this problem, and if I don't fix this problem, it's a bet the company, or it is a $5 billion problem for our company, they're going to always make the right decision. It's getting the facts and the information in front of them so they could make the right decision. Uh, and that sort of disconnect in information is something that I think is a, a pretty universal challenge. Um, I think that the uh, dedication and the funding to threat actor uh, groups is more substantial than what is happening for organizations and, and keeping pace with right. some of that threat activity has been uh, a challenge. Um, and of course, knowing what technologies to trust and the supply chain and the ecosystem that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, I, I don't think the days are gone where we can say we have this one tool that we use and that's going to protect us. 
those days are gone. It has to be the technology. It has to be the people and the right team. It has to be policies that really govern and direct. Um, so it's a it's a lot of different facets, but it's it, it, once it's put in place, you can manage it. That's the great thing about it is this is manageable risk. You just have to do the steps necessary to understand it. So how can organizations keep up with all the laws and regulations and, you know, that, that are in place? Um, you know, the people are interacting with these businesses in many different ways, like you said, via their phone, via their, you know, computer system, whatever it is, there's a lot of interaction. Happening. There's a lot of law and regulation. I think, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes companies, you know, uh, rather turn a blind eye to the, to the reality of things than to kind of, kind of face it. So it, like, how do they keep up with all that? And I, and I think a lot of are afraid to, to involve attorneys. And I always kind of, I'm, I'm shocked when I hear that and I'm not sure why, uh, but I think that that's something that's, um, that's a big mistake. They should, they should consult with the law firm, uh, especially to help them figure out what those laws and regulations are. Would you agree? You know, it, it may be not a law firm. It doesn't always have to be a law firm. I'd say uh, empower yourself with the information. And okay. if you don't have time to do it, then find somebody you trust that does has made this their life, right? That they are really focused on it. Um, so there are resources where you can pull, um, you know, podcasts like this is a, a great information sharing opportunity um, or websites or, or feeds where you're actually getting real time information. Um, the other thing that you mentioned is fear, right? I think that it, so much of information security um, has the opportunity to be controlled by the amygdala, which mm -hmm. is the fight, flight, or freeze. And so many companies freeze because it's complicated or it's too much or, hey, even if I do all these things, if somebody wants in bad enough, they're getting in. Right, right. Right. So what am I really doing here investing time and money? Um, I do think that uh, if you get out of the amygdala, you get into that that analytical reasoning piece of it, this is just risk. It's a different medium, but it's just risk. So are you going to accept risk uh, that you understand? And, and maybe you're misaligned on your risk appetite. Like you might say, um, I'm a startup. I don't have a lot of money. I need right. to get out there. Right. And you're going to have a lot higher risk appetite than if you're a company who's about to have investment deals. You're publicly traded. You have litigation ongoing. Um, you have product design defects, right? Your risk appetite is going to be really low. Um, so it's really understanding and aligning that and then having people you trust get the facts you need so you can make good decisions. So we only have a couple of minutes left. I, I always like, I want to end it on this. So uh, I'm a major company. I just had a major breach. Just give me your first, maybe two or three, you know, what are, what are kind of the first steps you should take right away. I like when Andre, uh, our founder of Life Arts, he tells a story. He says, he always starts it off and it's great. He goes, you know, you're a CISO. You just found out you had a major breach. Sit down, relax, drink a glass of water and begin working on your resume. You know, that's, that's always his opening <laughs> line. And, and I love it because it does scare some people when they hear that. So I'd love to hear your kind of your thoughts. Uh, besides working on your resume, what should you do? Uh, you're a business and you've had a major breach. So first, you're going to go to your incident response policy, assuming your systems aren't encrypted. Right. Um, you're going to, uh, and if you if they are encrypted, hopefully you have a nice little binder where it's been printed out. Uh, you're also going to pull your cyber insurance policy, and you're going to start looking at who your team's going to be. Uh, if you want to conduct a privileged investigation, um, you're going to have to engage outside counsel sooner rather than later. Right. Uh, so it's really rallying the team, and again, it's going to be the the people, process, technology. Um, with regards to, uh, say, an encryption event, really, you have the right technical people thinking about how do we get our operations back up and running? And you've got legal thinking about how are we investigating this? Um, and sometimes those are overlapping and sometimes they're at odds. So you really having those plans that say who's on first, what's on second can be incredibly successful and hopefully by the time the event actually happens, you're just rerunning your playbook and you're just practicing what you've already practiced in your in your breach sim simulations. So um, hopefully it's not completely new and and you know maybe you're drinking a glass of wine and preparing your resume. Um, <laughs> but it's it really should just be um, something that is so baked into what you've already done. You've got right. a playbook for this. 
Um, and then again, if you have that checklist and you have practice it, you're going to be making decisions based out of that analytical reasoning brain rather than your amygdala. So it'll all just go hopefully pretty smoothly. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. I, I love it. Hopefully you come back again. We can uh, maybe dive a little deeper in some other topics, but it's been a great, uh, great time chatting. And hopefully people find this valuable because I, I, I did. I always, I always enjoy uh, speaking to different people in the industry and you've been, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for helping companies really understand these issues in a, in a way that they can relate to. So thank you for that. Thank you. Take care.